This episode is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is the new digital hub for market intelligence. The Tegas platform empowers investors and corporate development teams to invest smarter by pairing best-in-class technology with the highest quality user-generated content and data. Tegas content is powered by many of the world's leading institutional investors, where their expert calls are recorded, transcribed, and uploaded to the shared platform, leading to the highest quality content and data sets. Tegas also recently acquired BAMSEC, which will allow users to seamlessly toggle between financial data, management commentary, and expert interviews as they get up to speed on a company. Any customer who signs up for Tegas before May 31st will receive a free BAMSEC license as part of their subscription. Find out why a majority of top firms are using Tegas on a daily basis. Head to tegas.com slash Patrick for your free trial. This episode is sponsored by Delupa. Delupa streamlines a major pain point for investors. By capturing all of a company's KPIs and adjusting financials into their database, Delupa makes it easy to quickly update your models for what matters. So many investors I speak to complain about juggling multiple company earnings or rushing to ramp on a new investment. Delupa uses AI to find every KPI disclosed, from charts to text, and even from footnotes of investor presentations. Delupa updates these KPIs and data points in your existing Excel models in one click, regardless of your source or format. Try Delupa for free at delupa.com slash Patrick. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. I am Compound248, and today we are pleased to announce and kick off a business breakdown mini-series focused on digital infrastructure. Over the coming months, we will break down a handful of companies that are key players in the digital infrastructure asset class, an asset class that undergirds and powers all modern digitally connected experiences, everything from streaming video to business collaboration tools to crypto mining to your everyday internet experience. And we are pleased to be bringing you this podcast in partnership with Roundhill Investments, the advisor to the Roundhill IO Digital Infrastructure ETF, Byte, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol BYTE. The fund tracks the Byte Index, which measures the performance of 40 leading global digital infrastructure businesses, such as towers and mobile communications, fiber and fixed line connectivity, and data centers. For a prospectus and more information, please visit roundhillinvestments.com slash ETF slash bite. Read carefully. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. Investors should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Distributor Foreside Fund Services, LLC. Our hope with this mini-series is to give you an understanding of the businesses that underpin our modern lives, giving us an almost magical, ubiquitous, connected existence. How is it, for example, that Netflix, based in Seattle, is able to deliver a perfect streaming experience to your phone in the backseat of a New York City taxi cab? Digital infrastructure powers that experience. This inaugural episode of the Digital Infrastructure Business Breakdown mini-series will begin with one of the broadest, most important companies in the industry, Digital Bridge, a company that is part private equity firm, part asset owner, and part infrastructure operator of assets across the digital infrastructure spectrum. To guide us through Digital Bridge, we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by Mark Ganzi, the CEO of Digital Bridge. And I'll let Mark introduce himself, but you help popularize the term digital infrastructure. Maybe you can sort of intertwine some of your own history into telling us what you mean when we say the word digital infrastructure. First of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast with you. This has been a fun, almost 30-year journey for me. Like most great entrepreneurs, I say I was a bit of the accidental tourist. I started my career in commercial real estate. 
and was focused on real estate development. Whilst I came out of Wharton and went to work for one of the bigger real estate developers in the Philadelphia area, as the young guy on the totem pole, antenna leases got put on my desk. And I didn't even know what an antenna lease was in 1994. What ended up happening was accidentally by being the antenna czar of this real estate company, like most studious, young, bright-eyed Wartnites, I went out and tried to find other people that understood what cellular communications was and what was a radio or a TV antenna. And I ended up finding a couple of other Wharton graduates that were actually in the cellular telephone business. In 1994, as I started getting more intelligent about that, I asked a really simple question, which was, how much other property is going to be needed to build out mobile communications? At that point in time, analog, cellular, which was typically 900 megahertz, maybe 50 to 100 cell sites per major city, if you're thinking about that from just a demand perspective. And that accidental moment where I was trying to figure out how to get the correct rent for my rooftop and figure out how many more other antenna leases were going to be coming created that eureka moment, which was, wow, all of this stuff is going to go digital in 1996, 1997. There's going to be thousands of real estate locations that are needed. And hence was born a tower company, purely by accident, like all great business plans. It was myself and two other Wharton graduates, and we figured out how to put together a business that was aimed at building towers and rooftop infrastructure to serve, at that point in time, the cellular A block and B block carriers. Along comes digital PCS and the world changes. Everyone carries a cell phone, and I never look back. I look back at that moment in 1994, and the purpose of my life changed which was not so much focused on how do I develop a great office building or how do I sell a great shopping center, but really how could I go be the landlord of the future in building out mobile communications? We just called it digital real estate at the time. It wasn't that complicated. Nobody really had a sense for what it was. As time went on, it became clear to us that it was mission critical infrastructure. It wasn't real estate, actually. It was something that was required and necessary to be able to pull these networks forward. And along with that came ecosystem, the idea of putting fiber into office buildings. And so we launched our second startup called Eureka Networks, the first full fiber to the office building, fiber to the premises business plan, which was way ahead of its time at that point. And then we got connected with Mike Faust and Raul Martinek, and we started buying data centers. All of this ecosystem was being developed in different swim lanes. So Towers had its own swim lane, fiber had its own swim lane, data centers had its own swim lane. And the golden moment was when dark fiber started hitting cell towers and you stopped backhauling to a switch and you started front hauling to a major network facility, which was typically in a data center. That's where we began to see convergence. So in 2008, I started calling it digital infrastructure because I felt like to just simply call it digital real estate was in some respects limiting how important it was and how expansive the universe was. It was a guess. I'll be totally honest. It was a guess that this was going to be something that would endure. But others started calling it digital infrastructure. We fast forward to 2013 when we sold Global Tower Partners, which was our fourth startup, the three guys that I'd worked together back in 1994. We made a decision that we wanted to just focus on digital infrastructure, not just cell towers and fiber, but investing across the ecosystem. So in 2013, myself and Ben Jenkins and Alex Gelman, we formed Digital Bridge with a bold mission to be the largest owner, operator, and investor in digital infrastructure in the world, much to the same way that we believe that John Malone has been to the cable industry and to communications. We think what we've built is something that's very unique and very akin, but exclusively in the digital infrastructure world. So that was the journey of how we got there. It wasn't totally thought out properly, probably on a white sheet of paper, but I think where we've ended up and where we've gotten to is really interesting. I would tell you today, the journey is more fun today than it was 27 years ago, 28 years ago when we got started. There's so much happening in our world and so much is changing. This notion of convergence and converge networks is rapidly evolving in front of our eyes. A lot of that has to do with the cloud and has to do with software-defined networks. And so the next 20 years, you and I will be talking about what's the impact of software-defined networks on infrastructure. How does that change infrastructure? Are we more asset light? Are we going more to a virtualized world? Some of it, yes. Some of it, no. Some of it you need on-premises. Some you're going to move off-premises. Some you're going to move into the cloud. But what's so absolutely exciting is we can sit here today and have this conversation and know that everything we're doing is changing. And that change will happen over the next decade as we build 5G networks, as we continue to build out the cloud, as we build out edge infrastructure, as we begin to embrace artificial intelligence. As we begin to think about the industrial use cases for IoT networks, there's just a lot happening. So that's sort of my big intro, I guess. 
I think your professional history is fundamentally intertwined with the evolution of the space. It's gone from that voice network to basically the foundation of modern life sitting on top of digital infrastructure. And so to me, the word infrastructure evokes something that you are saying is slightly different than digital real estate. Maybe you could help me understand the nuance of what you mean by infrastructure and then really how big the addressable opportunity set is. It's about permanency. I think when you're talking about real estate, you're talking about a landlord-tenant relationship and there's a finite period of tenancy and occupation. When you talk about infrastructure, you're talking about something that's so fundamental, fundamental to what we do day in and day out. Perhaps that eureka moment for the rest of the world was the pandemic, realizing how much that we relied on broadband communications to our home. And whether it was using our mobile phone or it was either using our laptop or it was streaming or online fitness, everything that we were doing at that point in time revolved around the ability for mobile infrastructure and broadband infrastructure to work. If it didn't work, none of us would have been able to survive the pandemic. This was the big test moment, I think, for our sector and our industry. And we showed up and we represented really well. People's infrastructure worked. We conducted commerce. You and I were on many Zoom and team calls during the pandemic. I think this notion of permanency and this notion that infrastructure is here, digital infrastructure is here to stay, it's not going anywhere. That's the big distinction between moving from a real estate model to an infrastructure model. I think you as an investor know this, you got to follow the flow of the capital. If you think about how towers and fiber and data centers were financed in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, it was mostly by venture capital and private equity which had a very short-term horizon on how to think about these asset classes. Fast forward to today, and you have infrastructure funds around the world competing for digital assets. In fact, it's the number one asset in demand for infrastructure funds. Most infrastructure funds are 12 to 14-year duration funds. So you've got longer-term capital, lower IRRs, more patient capital, and most importantly, you have a huge amount of influx of capital chasing arguably a $13 trillion TAM that's growing every year at a half a trillion dollars. Last year, there was over $500 billion of CapEx spent in new greenfield digital infrastructure. Before that, it was $485 billion in 2020. And before that, it was $460 something billion. So it's gone from 460 to 485 to 500. It'll be 512 to 515 this year. Our TAM continues to grow and the growth CAGR continues to move up. This is important because that means that there's a lot of infrastructure that's going to be built over the next decade as we talk about the things that you and I are going to talk about today, next generation networks. If I move from the TAM now to Digital Bridge specifically, you and Ben, as you said, nine years ago, set out to build the leading investor in the space. I think it's pretty fair to say you've become that and we'll get to what that looks like. It's been a crazy journey in getting to your public DBRG Digital Bridge. By way of background, I'll just give a little color, which is... Several years ago, you merged your private entrepreneur-built digital bridge entity into the publicly traded REIT that was Colony Capital. And it seems like that was really a chance to give the Colony team an exit and a future. And so for your first few years, you had this parallel job of winding down all of Colony's legacy real estate. It was a generalist real estate manager while simultaneously continuing to build your digital bridge franchise. And it appears that at the end of last year, you kind of planted the flag and said, mission accomplished. We've effectively exited all that. And we are now a digital IM and digital balance sheet focused business. So I think I've given the basic gist of Colony's history, but maybe you can give us a little bit of the digital bridge side and how that brings us to this moment. Yeah, well, you take the clock back to 2013. I just sold my REIT to American Tower for about $5 billion. And Ben had been a key investor in that for three years, from 2005 to 2008, when Blackstone owned our business. We were having breakfast together, and he said, I can't think of any better business in the world than the tower business. And I said, well, there's actually a couple of other ones. There's fiber, there's small cells, there's data centers, there's Wi-Fi offload. There's a bunch of different business models. He'd made the decision to leave Blackstone after 16 years, and I was unemployed for the first time in maybe 20 years. So we sat down and said, well, what do we want to do next? And we had a bold vision, which was to be an owner and operator of digital infrastructure on a global scale. A bit ambitious at that time, we sort of sketched it out on a napkin and said, here's what we think it could look like. 
it started first and foremost with betting on ourselves. I tell every great entrepreneur, you got to bet on yourself. And we both looked at each other and made a commitment. We'd put a certain amount of capital to work in deals that we would sponsor. We would go out and raise third-party capital side by side with it. The whole idea was to create an operating model where we deployed our own capital side by side with LP capital. We could own assets in permanency, not be beholden to traditional fund structures, and made the decision that we were going to be in this for the long haul and that this would be what we would do for the next 20 years of our lives. What ended up happening was we spent the first, I would say, five years of the journey, not in a fund structure, but really doing bespoke deals one by one, where we were putting up our capital as a fundless sponsor. And we did six deals, raised about $4.2 billion of equity. We put in a lot of our own personal capital into those deals. We wanted to bet on ourselves. And it was the right bet. That $4 billion of capital has turned into about $20 billion of assets in a very short period of time. It's been an incredible rise for us. We generally underlevered those assets at about 35% loan to value. And we created a monster portfolio of really high quality companies with great CEOs running their own businesses, but giving them the support from behind and helping them with financing, helping them with M&A, operations, IT, and being a very hands-on differentiated investor. That resonated really well with investors. But what happened is as we were successful, we sort of awoke the bear and the bear was Blackstone and Carlisle, KKR, Brookfield, Apollo, Macquarie, Stone Peak, EQT, everyone wanted to be in digital infrastructure. So we were a bit of a victim of our own success. And we said, look, the game changed overnight. We had big funds stepping into our arena, writing massive commitments with little diligence and moving very quickly. So we decided we had to go raise a fund or else we weren't going to be competitive. The days of doing sponsorless transactions where we had 90 days to get a deal done didn't exist anymore. Infrastructure funds moved fast. They had big funds and they could make billion dollar bets in less than 30 days. We had to adapt. We had to change. So we launched our first fund, which ended up being a joint venture with Colony Capital. They'd had some experience in digital infrastructure investing in data centers, and it had gone really well. So they'd made money in the sector. They understood the sector. And most importantly, they had a brand, they had a name. They were very good at forming capital. So we entered into this joint venture to go raise a $3 billion fund, and we ended up raising four. That was our first connection into the colony world. What ended up happening is that fund was wildly successful. We ended up deploying the capital in 18 months. We made 10 investments. The board of Colony really liked what they saw. And the board said, why stop there? Why don't we transform the business and move completely towards digital and digital infrastructure? So we merged our businesses together in 2019. The board named me at the signing of that transaction, the CEO in waiting, and I was allowed to bring in my own management team and transform the company. We went to go raise a second fund last year, which we finished in December. We had targeted $6 billion. We ended up raising eight point three in nine months. The uptake from investors was really quite fast. We've now made nine investments out of that fund, and we've branched into other lines of businesses like credit and core, liquid securities and ventures and It's been an incredible journey. It's been a lot of fun. Now we're investing across the ecosystem because we're taking our domain expertise. We're taking our knowledge as operators and we're applying that discipline to credit. We're applying it to late stage venture capital. We're applying that to core and core plus. On the other side of that, we now have a $52 billion platform that operates in Europe, Asia, and here in North America, and of course, Latin America. So we're operational across the globe today, over 230 investment professionals, across really seven offices, and really no end in sight. We're on this cadence, we're announcing a deal a week. We're able to deploy capital. We believe in intelligent and thoughtful ways. As long as we keep returning capital, which is the most important part of our job, and creating returns, I think we'll continue to be able to raise new capital and continue to chart the course of the new digital bridge. From an outside owner standpoint, looking in at the digital bridge, hold co, so to speak, I kind of mentally bucket into two businesses. You've got What we've just been talking about, your IM business, your investment management business, just closed this $8.3 billion fund. And then on the other hand, you have your balance sheet assets where you are also directly investing both into your funds, but also into private companies. So I'd love to kick into those two things separately. We could just start with the economic profile of the IM business, the investment management business. First, could you just clarify, is there any economic difference to shareholders today between the funds that you raised before you merged into the public entity versus the funds you raise now? 
and how you think about apportioning the fee and value creation economics between shareholders and employees. The way we've invested has not changed. In fact, I would offer to you, it hasn't changed in like 28 years. The way I've always thought about investing is an incredibly disciplined framework that involves an intensive amount of physical underwriting, which is that real estate background I have. Of, you got to read a lease. You got to understand your entitlements. You got to understand how do you take fee? I mean, basic blocking and tacking principles that any smart real estate professional would use, we use in digital infrastructure. You got to underwrite the assets. First, we're rigorous in terms of how we underwrite. The second piece is, can we build a good business? Are we backing a good business? Are we putting our capital to work behind people that we think are best in class? And do they have a good business plan? Is this the right way for us to go? And on that basis, I think we've done a really good job. We've backed really great people, building great businesses. But that first gate you got to move through is you got to underwrite the assets correctly. That doesn't change. Our framework, our two-step framework from asset underwriting to business plan underwriting has remained intact. I would say that first part of our business, the investment management business, it's a great business. We either manage capital and permanent capital vehicles in our legacy portfolio, or we're managing 11, 12-year funds where there's a lot of predictability around cash flows and your expenses. It's a nice business because there's not a lot of moving pieces. It's good margin business. We've been able to increase our margins year over year, three years in a row. As you add new investment management products, you're adding a little bit of people, but you're not adding a lot of people. It's a people business. But remember, you're sharing the common infrastructure of IT, investor relations, fundraising, C-suite, Section 16, all of that cost, that apparatus is fixed. As we go out and we raise new strategies and we deploy that capital, along with that comes FIM. As the FIM grows and the expenses grow slower, you see this gap in terms of even margins and our profitability, which is candidly why investors like that business. Investors have enjoyed investing in Blackstone. They've enjoyed investing in... EQT or Apollo or KKR or Carlisle. I mean, publicly traded investment managers, alternative asset managers have performed extremely well over the last three to four years. It's kind of the golden moment of that sector. Blackstone, we raise funds, we put that capital to work. We've got a great team of professionals globally from Singapore to London to Boca to New York to LA that get after it every day. And I'm pretty happy with that business because from a financial perspective, it's been growing at like 30% CAGR now for three years. We've done a phenomenal job growing the digital IM business. I think investors are really happy with that. We had a great announcement today where we acquired the stake of Wafra out of our digital GP business for about $800 million, immediately accretive day one. And as we continue to raise funds, getting 100% of those revenues and profits that flow to our public shareholders is just good news. Just to put a bullet on that, they owned a minority stake of your investment management business. Yes, not at the parent company. So effectively, you've moved them to the parent company in exchange for some amount of parent equity and a cash payment. Yep. And I guess you'll also be converting from a REIT to a C-Corp, which we'll get into the balance sheet side a little bit. But that cleans up your ownership structure somewhat. Completely cleans it up. It's really simple. Public shareholders now own the company. Is there a difference between your earlier funds and your current funds from how the economics get split between the team and the owners? Not really. It depends on the fund, but we do typically send about 30 to 40 cents on the dollar in terms of our carried interest back to our public shareholders so they can participate in our success. For previously, we kept 100% of that. There is a bit of an economic difference there. It just depends fund by fund. By the way, Blackstone and EQT engage in the same practice. They send about 30 to 40 cents on the dollar back to public shareholders. I think the challenge in the investment management business is we're all trading on a multiple of FIM. We're not trading on carry. The street still to this day does not give you respect for your carried interest, which is fine. I'm okay with that. You're betting into the futures a little bit. So we are based on this notion of our ability to raise money, deploy capital, return capital, be profitable, be mindful of our expenses. And that's the underlying premise of why people buy one share of Blackstone stock or they buy Digiris stock. I think the other side of the business, the balance sheet is powerful. One of the things that we lacked at Digital Bridge from 2013 to 19 is we didn't have a balance sheet. The balance sheet was really Ben and my personal checkbook, which is pretty scary, which is hard. Like you're an entrepreneur and you've got to do that, but the checks kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it got harder and harder and harder. Part of that decision emerging with Colony at that time was they had a balance sheet. They had cash. The ability to weaponize that balance sheet and be able to raise new funds, put that money to work in the GP stake and in an intelligent way 
where we saw really good long-lived assets, we could deploy the balance sheet and swap out of hotels, swap out of medical properties, move into edge data centers and move into hyperscale data centers. Really, it was about swapping assets from assets that had a lot of CapEx, a lot of uncertainty in their rent rolls and low growth and moving them into high growth, low CapEx, longer term leases, more exposure to investment grade counterparties and being able to look our public shareholders in the eye and say, look, these are the assets you want. These are predictable. You look at stuff like Databank and Vantage, they're growing organically at 6 to 10% a year, and they have escalators at 2 to 4% a year. Your rent rolls are growing. You've got leasing that comes on top of that. You can put CapEx to work in new facilities. You get this really nice slopey growth curve that has predictable dividends, which is what shareholders want. They want return of capital. We can find no better place in terms of how we use our balance sheet by deploying into new funds and deploying it into what we think are the most high quality, long-lived digital infrastructure assets that create predictable and steady cash flow. What's the balance sheet side look like today if you apportion it between your funds and operating assets? It was historically kind of a 50-50 proposition between investment management and the balance sheet assets. What's happened is because of the popularity of our IM business and our digital infrastructure platform, we've been able to take that business from 12 billion of AUM to 20, it got to 36, then it got to 40, now it's at 52. And we did that in three years. It was incredible. And we tripled FIM in that same time period. We're now in this incredible growth trajectory curve. And that business is just growing faster. It's outpedaling the balance sheet side, which is where the REIT eligible assets were which is why we changed our tax election status. We kind of had no choice. Our taxable REIT subsidiary was growing a lot faster than our balance sheet assets, which is unusual in the REIT world when you think about it. That election was purely tax in nature. Nothing has changed. Everybody came to the work today here at DigiBridge and their job was the same, which is protect the balance sheet, grow it, put it to work in an intelligent way, go raise capital, deploy capital, grow FIM, grow AUM, keep bringing great ideas to investors and keep putting up great returns. And if you do that, most of it takes care of itself. No surprise, investors like what we're doing. It's a unique story. It's very differentiated. What we do is not what everybody else does. We are a little bit different in that digital re ecosystem. I think as you look at our peer set, whether it's Digital Realty or American Tower, they just wake up every day and they do one thing. American Tower goes and builds towers. Digital Realty goes and builds data centers and operates them. We operate across the entire ecosystem And sometimes we deploy our own capital off our balance sheet, or sometimes we're deploying third-party capital. But the idea is to own and operate the best businesses in the world that create the highest returns. What I've tried to do with the public story is align our private capital with our public capital. If you give us a dollar, if you're a public shareholder and you give me a dollar, my idea is it's digital infrastructure. We're going to return high teens to your life of the asset. If you bought Digital Bridge in the last two years, you've done better than high teens. Everything that I've been doing for the last two years is about getting everyone aligned. It's about creating symmetry between our public investors and our private investors. That was a hard line to walk, but we've managed to figure it out. We've put it into a format that our private investors and public investors understood. So for example, when we made this announcement about recasting our partnership with Wafer today, you've now created symmetry with Wafer in terms of where you want to go with the business. We try to find the right path to align all the constituents, which is my job as the CEO of the firm. If I look at that transaction, it seems to me that effectively, if it used to be you've got a 50-50 balance between IM and balance sheet, and it had already begun to skew toward IM, this skews it even further toward IM. You're taking capital off balance sheet, and you're buying more of your investment management business with that. So IM seems to be the primary focus of the future. How big can it be? I mean, you're in a vertical. It's a huge vertical, but you're not out there buying a database business, you're not going to be out there buying an industrial business, you're staying in digital infrastructure. How big can that space really be from an IM standpoint? Just in terms of new CapEx deployments, there's a half a trillion of new CapEx being deployed every year. We're typically growing our TAM over the last three years. We've gone from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50. So you can kind of get the cadence that we're on, which is we're deploying between eight and 12 billion a year in terms of assets under management. So once again, if you're taking a conservative view of leverage at 40 to 50% leverage and you back out that eight to 12 billion, let's say it's 10 billion a year, on average, we're deploying about 5.5 billion of equity a year against four and a half billion of leverage. 
At the same time, we've been on this nice cadence where we've been raising five to six billion a year in new capital, whether that's in our flagship funds or whether it's in credit or whether it's a core. As we've rolled out these new strategies and being a multi-strat firm, we've been able to deploy the capital. If I say to myself, okay, I wake up every day and my sandbox is $500 billion and I'm deploying 10 billion a year, I'm not taking that much of the market if you really think about it. I'm taking a very small percentage of the market. I'm taking two to 3% of the TAM every year. I'm okay with that. If I take two to 3% market share every year, we've told investors, we think we can be a $100 billion asset manager in five years. We don't think that's a crazy leap of faith to get there, to go from 50 billion to 100 billion between now and 2027. We don't think that that's that hard. We don't think that that's an imaginary putt. If you and I were out playing golf, it wouldn't be a 25 foot downhill double breaking putt. It would be an uphill 12 foot putt with a slight break. I like my chances is I think what I'm telling you. So if we transition towards the opportunity set from a return standpoint in your space, I think you just mentioned you thought LPs in your main private equity vehicle, they're probably trying to sign up for something like mid-teens net IRRs. Correct. If you look across your vertical, sort of there's towers, mobile infrastructure, fiber, data centers, et cetera. How does that compare and contrast? And what is the US non-US opportunity set? I would tell you today that probably half of our AUM sits here in this hemisphere, being Canada and the US. I would say the rest of our AUM sits in Europe, probably 25 to 30% of our AUM is there. And then probably 15 to 20% is in Asia and Latin America. I would tell you that I'm excited about Asia. We've been there for three years in digital. Our predecessor company was in Asia for almost two decades. So we did have people there. We had infrastructure there. We had relationships there. That was pretty helpful. We just had to reorient the business plan, moved our headquarters from Shanghai to Singapore, We got that done right before the pandemic, which was great. We made three really good investments over there. The appetite for what we do is growing faster in Asia than it is in Europe and North America, and certainly Latin America as well. The appetite for the assets, the CapEx side, right? Correct. In terms of the growth. So I'm pretty excited about that. I think there's a lot of really good opportunity ahead. We're going to continue to deploy capital in Asia. We've just made our first investment into Africa in a big hyperscale data center in Johannesburg. We truly are a global organization, but we know our bread and butter is here in the home zone. We'll keep putting the capital to work across all five regions. If I had to overweight or underweight certain regions right now, I think we're always on a steady cadence here in North America, but I think I'm a little overweight Asia and a little underweight Europe probably at the moment just given everything that's going on in Europe. It's a theater that has a lot of complication. And by every economist out there, you could argue that Europe's been in a recession for about a year now, maybe longer, if you're looking at economic data and sort of being honest about it. Latin America has been in a recession for a couple of years now, probably going on two or three years, and we've actually performed really well there. And it's hard to say what goes next. Is it the Americas or is it Asia? Hard to say where the next big economic trend is. What we do know is our customers are deploying more percentage of their CapEx budgets in Asia. Big cloud players are looking to build out workloads, some in China, but very few in China. Looking at the entire Asia theater, Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, Australia, India, that whole belt that surrounds China is just a massive TAM. I mean, it's huge. Just think about Southeast Asia. The four biggest countries in Southeast Asia are bigger than the United States. Add up Malaysia and Thailand and the Philippines and Indonesia, and you get, what is it, 380 million people? Bigger than the US, I think. So we made an investment in the tower space there. It's turned out great. Edgepoint's been a huge winner for us. We're over 18,000 towers in two and a half years. We hired the best management team. We put great resources on the ground to build new infrastructure, edge compute sites, small cells, towers, the fully converged mobile infrastructure solutions provider. And we got there early. We beat all the other infrastructure funds there by a year and a half. And being early and having conviction is how you really make money. My impression is over time, you have followed your logos, so to speak, as part of it. 100%. Your hyperscale FANG customers wants to go to Southeast Asia. You're going to try to take them there, so to speak. And maybe that's an opportunity for you to give us a little bit of color on how digital bridge professionals operate with your portfolio companies. And what is the role that you play in trying to add value as opposed to simply writing checks? Our deal teams are a bit different than a typical PE shop or an infrastructure fund. We typically have five to six professionals on every portfolio company. 
Most PE shops, as you know, put two to three people on a deal. We double that staffing per deal. The second big differentiator is the management teams of those portfolio companies think that we're an extension of the management team. They know our economics are totally aligned with theirs. So our performance fee aligns with their performance fee coming back to that notion of performance and making sure that everyone is aligned in the right direction. That's one of the key tenets of what we do. And then when we are involved, picking the places where we can really help the management team and augment them. We're very big on tuck-in M&A. That's an area where our deal teams help drive the management teams to go chase those smaller deals that are proprietary and very accretive. The second thing I would say is on capital markets. We have a lot of pricing power in the CMBS and ABS market. We're actively leading all of the securitizations and all the financings. We've got a finance team led by one of my great partners, Tommy Nagy. He's got a team of professionals that work with him. And we're constantly working the balance sheet. How do we get our cost of capital down? How do we extend tenor? How do we get fixed rates? We spent the last two years really buttoning down all our balance sheets because we knew a storm was coming. And so most of our debt across all of our portfolio companies is 30 years in nature already. Why? We just felt that coming out of the pandemic, there'd be a bit of acid indigestion from all the free money and stimulus money that you just can't print free money forever. So interest rates are now moving up. Risk premiums are gapping out. And our competitors have pulled back from a few processes where we've leaned in, largely because we know how to ultimately finance this asset class long-term. Having that conviction around the asset class without having to worry about the fluctuations of interest rates quarter to quarter is a good place to be. The other two areas we focus on is how to right-size the back office IT aspect of the business. We have a huge IT team here that, that integrates with our deal teams. We spent a lot of time around workflows and think a lot about dashboards and KPIs and metrics. And every Monday morning, we have a metrics call for an hour where the deal teams present every company, the leasing backlog, the built to suit backlog, the growth rates, the churn. There's only about five or six dials that you can really tweak in this business. I know all of those metrics every week. I have my dashboards. So I have 25 companies globally. Every week, I get a report and I know exactly what's happening. Because I can tell you with a leasing pipeline, a built to suit pipeline and a churn pipeline, I can tell you the health of a business, whether it's fiber, data centers, or towers. If I just have my flaps and my rudder, I know exactly how the plane is going to fly. It's not that hard. You got thrust, you got flaps, you got rudders. In digital infrastructure, you got leasing pipeline, built to suit pipeline, and churn. If you know those three things, you know exactly how the business is performing. It's not rocket science. We've got that now distilled into a set of dashboards and KPIs where it's really easy for us to manage our businesses. And asset management, as you know, is really important. It's a big part of what we do. The last thing I would say is customer relationships. That's super important. Us here at DigiBridge having those great relationships, whether it's a Microsoft or an Amazon or it's Google or it's Meta or it's Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile or Telefonica or Vodafone, 30 years of doing this, we have those relationships. Those are deep customer relationships. Those are not superficial relationships. When I get on the phone with somebody from a U.S. mobile carrier and I say, look, we're going to perform for you. We're going to show up. We're going to deliver that network. We're doing that not from a private equity stance. I'm delivering that message to my customer as an operator because they know that I've been operating these assets for multiple decades and I've earned that trust. That trust cannot be acquired. So whilst we do have a lot of competition that have come into our asset space, they can't have that same relationship that we have with customers because you got to earn it. It takes time. Delivering networks at 5.9 standards and not screwing that up is really important. That's another key tenet, is making sure the infrastructure stays online 24-7. And then when they do need you to show up, and as you said, follow the logos, if one of my customers says, look, we need 50 megawatts in Seoul, Korea, we say, great, we'll meet you there. We'll figure it out. Or when this particular cloud player said, we need 100 megawatts in Johannesburg, we figured it out because that's what you do. You show up for your customers. There's a lot to dig into in there. So you mentioned preparing for this maybe slightly worsening moment from a macro standpoint with long-term financing, et cetera. Are you seeing that show up on your dashboards? Are you seeing changes in the demand? I mean, we had this huge COVID pull forward. Is that a new plateau from which we're returning to standard growth? Or are you seeing a slowdown in either the hyperscale side or on the telco side? No, I would say to the contrary to that, we've actually seen an acceleration, particularly in the cloud players. Their appetite for network and for new compute is really hard to fathom. So that would be fiber and data centers? Yeah, fiber connectivity to the data center and providing those mission-critical applications and that high-powered compute 
is totally central to what we do now, making sure that we can deliver that network holistically for them. So not just providing space power and cooling, but also space power, cooling connectivity and edge connectivity. So having an intricate conversation with the head of infrastructure, one of these cloud players, and yes, it's awesome to sign a 12 megawatt lease or a 50 megawatt lease. But what's really going to be awesome is when we enter into multi-location edge compute discussions where we're saying, okay, we can deliver 80 locations, four racks here, 12 racks there. We start doing wholesale leasing, much like we did in the 90s with the mobile operators when they were trying to build coverage. The same thing is happening with the cloud players. They need coverage on the periphery of the networks. They've got the big cities covered. It's really going to that secondary tertiary and suburbs where you've got to build the infrastructure. It's got to match what's happening. That's kind of how we're going to spend the next decade. So does Edge then compete with those core assets or complement them? How should somebody think about that? And then how does that work across your portfolio companies where you might have one business that's more Edge focused and another that's more hyperscale wholesale focused? Like How do those pieces come together? It's a little bit of what we call data gravity. You have to think about ultimately the cloud players having literally four different concentric circles of availability zones is what they call it. So when you're sitting with one of the big cloud players, you say, I need an availability zone here because I have to have compute available to my constituents today, which is mostly retail and enterprise. Eventually, it'll be machine to machine too. To build that compute, you've got obviously the large availability zones, which are the big core workloads, which is five megawatts and up. You then have mid-range hyperscale workloads, circa one megawatt to five megawatts, which is that first layer of the edge. Then you have what I would call edge enterprise, which is 250 kW to 500 kW, which can be anything from 10 racks to 50 racks. And then you have true micro edge, which is a small edge data center that's sitting at a base of a tower, It's sitting in a central office somewhere. It's in the basement of a large office building in downtown area where you're really being surgical about where you're putting that high power compute. So big availability zone, mid-range, edge, and then micro edge. Four circles that move out in terms of power density, total compute. And that's how those customers think about their world today. It's a function of power and compute. Basically, each of those is getting a little closer to the end user. Yes, Yes, low latency compute. You've just nailed it. It's all about low latency compute. From that standpoint, and again, thinking about your dashboards, if you look at the telcos today and the state of the 5G rollout, where would you say we are on that rollout? And how is that touching your businesses? If we were playing a proper, the old cliche analogy, a nine inning baseball game, we're probably in the top of the second inning. So pretty early maybe beginning the bottom of the second. So far, the first two years of 5G deployment has been about macro overlay, one for one hitting the LTE sites with a 5G upgrade. That's going on a big tower, basically. Yeah, big macro site, big rooftop, big tower. That'll go on for another two to three years, which is why you've seen the publicly traded US tower companies trade up a little bit, American Tower, SBA Crown, et cetera. We're starting to see some small cells. Once again, overlays, one for one overlays. I think we're probably two years away from hardcore densification, which is new search rings for small cells and new search rings for macro sites. And then I think as part of that densification, you end up really looking at the edge infrastructure too. Where are you going to put the edge data centers? Where are you going to begin to build that redundancy where you have mobile edge meeting cloud edge together? Those two worlds inevitably have to collide. You're laying that out as two to three years from now. But if I'm one of those telcos, that means I'm in hardcore planning mode right now, which means Mark and I are hip to hip on this, so to speak. What is your status of building out edge, data center capacity, compute capacity? What does that look like from a digital bridge standpoint? We put out the guidance last quarter that we've got about $6.6 billion of greenfield capex that we committed to this year. So that gives you a sense of where we are. If we're going to deploy 10 billion of AUM this year and 6.6 billion is in Greenfield, we're basically telling the world that two thirds of our capital is going towards new growth and new network deployment. And the other third will be traditional platform building or M&A. It's a pretty ambitious year if you think about it. We got a lot of shovels in the ground right now. You're in the development business. We are, but we're not building naked. We're building with a long-term 10, 15, 25-year contract 
from an investment grade counterparty, which is why we think investors really like our business long term. That begins with at least some level of IRR that's on the table when you begin. And so I presume most of your assets, that initial customer contract is going to get you somewhere to a positive IRR. And then the goal is to fill above that. Is that a fair description? 100% a fair description. Minimum cash on cash yield, looking somewhere between 3 to 6%, depending on the swim lane. Once you lever that, that IRR moves into the high single digits, low double digits. Then once you get co-location, whether it's a new fiber route, a new data center, a new tower, a new small cell, those returns move from low teens to mid to high teens, like you said earlier. By the way, if you happen to get a third tenant, that's pretty good. The third tenant moves it up into a zone that's beyond traditional infrastructure IRRs. And then hopefully you get cap rate compression on that as well. You do. Absolutely. If I think of that 60 to 70% build, 30 to 40% buy, and you go back five years when you said you just started to notice the big guys, the KKRs and Blackstones coming in and competing with you, how would you say the competitive environment has shifted? How would you say the risk and return profile of your asset class has shifted? It's gotten more compressed. It's just simple inflows. More people fishing out of the same pond some experienced, some with little experience, but nonetheless, it doesn't change the fact that you've got other people in the pool thus trying to grab a piece of that $500 billion per year TAM. And I don't blame them. If I was an alternative asset manager or just a traditional asset manager, I'd want to be in renewables and I'd want to be in logistics and I'd want to be in digital. And to strong credit, that's what our smart peers are doing. If you look at what a Blackstone's doing or you look at what a KKR is doing, this is the path forward for alternative asset managers. You mentioned earlier, you have these 2 to 4% or 1% to 3% annual rate increases on a lot of your multi-year contracts. Help me understand how you think about inflation. So if inflation starts running 8% and you can pass through 3%, It is running at 8%. (laughs) Yes. If it continues to run at 8% and you can pass through 3%, how does that help hurt? How do you manage that? What I would tell you is gently rental rates have gone up. It's not just home prices. It's not just multifamily or industrial. Digital lease rates have moved up. What we're getting per rack, what we're getting per tower, what we're getting per strand, all of those metrics have been moving up pretty steadily for last year. Some of our revenues are CPI protected. So we pass that cost of living adjustment through to the customer. Some of it isn't. But by and large, across all of our infrastructure, we're not paying utilities. Utilities are a pass. Our business is principally a CAM related business where the CAM is pushed through to the ultimate customer. Some of that CAM we can push through, like real estate taxes and site maintenance and things of that nature. But what I would tell you is we feel pretty good about where lease rates are. Globally speaking, we've seen rents move up which is good, which is what you'd expect, I think. You've seen us take on less inflation risk in the form of swapping out a fixed 3 or 4% escalator for a CPI escalator. And so our business is pretty well buttressed because we have high organic growth, got low churn. We do have escalators, some are CPI, some are fixed, and most of our utilities are a pass-through. We do feel like we've got one of the better insulated businesses in the world. When a lease comes up for a renewal currently, is that a, quote, opportunity to reset price or is it really like we're just happy to keep it? There's a balance, right? Because it's dynamic. It's not just one location. So if I'm having a renewal discussion with T-Mobile, it's not about one tower. It's about many towers. A discussion with them about their dark fiber to the tower, it's going to be thousands of towers that I provide connectivity services. So some of that renewal is we're either protecting price or we're looking at a backlog of new stuff that we're doing with them, or we're extending tenor. Once again, it's only a couple levers you can push on, which is you can extend term, you can keep the rent the same, you can move the rents up, you can maybe mess with the escalator a couple years down the road. There's different things, and you've just got to be so attuned to your customer. This is where being an operator really helps, because you've got to be an active listener. you got to understand what every customer is saying from a treasury perspective, because some of them might hate escalators. Some of them might want to straight line the rent over 15 years instead of eight years because of different accounting treatments. So some of this is accounting driven and you have to be sensitive to that and understand what they're thinking about from an accounting perspective. Some it's operational driven. Well, they'll tell us, look, we don't need these things and we're going to terminate them, but we do need infrastructure over here. So we're going to trade that ETF and we're going to take 50 cents on the dollar on ETF. We're going to apply it to new business, early termination piece. Sorry to get kind of in the weeds, but no, that's what we want. It's pretty complicated stuff. 
People sometimes criticize Crown or American Tower for having these big holistic, every three to five years, they announce a big MLA. Which is a master leasing agreement. There's some revenue that comes off and they're doing a good job, actually. What they're doing is they're engaging in the business of revenue assurance, which is once again, why investors like our sector. Because if we do go into a recession or if our economy turns, what do you know? You know that our carriers are going to still pay the rents. They have to. We learned that in the financial crisis. People were happy to give away the keys to their house and the keys to their car, but guess what they didn't give away in 2008 and 2009? They did not give back their cell phones. They didn't cut off their home internet service. Right. Those were the two things that were sort of sacred cows. So we've talked about inflation and what it is or is not as a threat. Edge and distributed compute sounds, frankly, more like opportunity than threat for your business. In other technologies, help me understand other threats. So Elon Musk wants to build the internet in the sky through SpaceX and Starlink. How does that compete with your assets? Threat, opportunity, or TBD? Big opportunity. Remember, whether it's Hyper or whether it's Starlink, OneWeb, they all need Earth-based infrastructure. They all need data centers. They all need fiber. And we're providing that. We're in active discussions, and we have all three of them as customers. I won't go too much into the details of it because it's pretty strategic and we're under NDA, but they're customers. They're going to be customers for a long time. I think Elon has a perspective around what Starlink will be. I totally agree with his perspective. He looks at a Tesla car and other cars that use the Tesla operating platform the same way Tim Cook looked at an iPhone 15 years ago. You got to think differently when you're talking about Elon Musk. He's a different cat. He's so smart. He thinks in different dimensions, whether it's a Tesla or other people on the Tesla platform. There's hundreds of millions of cars that need to communicate. On average, most Americans spend just a little under two hours a day in their car. Well, you spend, what, eight, nine hours at work? You spend a couple hours at your home awake where you're maybe watching TV or you're having dinner with your family. When you think about that and what a car has to do, particularly the cars of the future that are going to drive autonomously or semi-autonomously, the car becomes an information hub. It knows where you're going. It knows where you're buying groceries. It knows where you're getting your dry cleaning. It knows your coffee you want. And I think he thinks of the car as a personal communications device and a personal travel device. So your most efficient routing to work is to that Starbucks, not this one. And oh, by the way, by the time you go through, your coffee's waiting. Why? Because you ordered it on your Tesla. Start thinking that way. It's a little bit different way to think about it. I'm very bullish on what he's doing, and we hope that they'll continue to grow with us as a customer. In digital infrastructure, what we've really talked about is the journey of a byte of data from, call it Netflix in Seattle, until it gets to the last mile, and then it gets handed off to some consumer-facing business like Verizon or Comcast. How does Digital Bridge itself think about consumer-facing, quote, digital infrastructure? And is that an asset class you'd ever move into? What are the trade-offs there? You've got to think a little bit about the distinction between passive and active infrastructure and how far up the chain we want to go. The question is whether or not should we be owning active infrastructure? But I also think at the same time, like you and I talked about earlier, the definition of active infrastructure is changing. This whole notion of software-defined networks and you start moving the radios into the cloud. And once again, you got to think in different dimensions. That's the way I think about it. I think about these things in a slightly different dimension today because everything we're touching has a software layer to it. And this notion of software-defined networks is beginning to change how we think about infrastructure. I would offer to you that maybe software is a form of infrastructure. I call it SIAS, which is software as an infrastructure service. But you do have to be thinking about that. I think that's the genius of what Ericsson and Nokia have done and what Samsung is doing is they've moved from a radio model to a software-based subscriber model, giving permanency to their business, creating a layer of infrastructure that nobody else can own. So we need to think in those dimensions. We need to be thinking about is the next frontier in digital infrastructure is in software or software-defined networks. That doesn't sound like you're getting into a consumer-facing business. Well, it depends on your definition of consumer. So how far will you go up the passive versus active discussion? Are you prepared to own not only the broadband infrastructure, but are you prepared to own the lateral into the home? Are you prepared to own the router that's in the home? How far will you go to touch the consumer? So far, we've stayed out of that fight because it's been kind of a knife fight. But what I would say is when we begin to think about machine to machine connections, I have a different view. I do want to be in the business of machine to machine connectivity because that is infrastructure. We're owning the back end of those types of business models. We do have businesses that face enterprise. In businesses like Zeo and Databank, we are enterprise facing. 
we're not consumer facing, but we've made the decision that we are interfacing and we are taking revenues from enterprises. And eventually we're going to be taking businesses from machine to machine applications as well. So maybe a little less bullish on direct consumer, but very bullish on enterprise and very bullish on machine connectivity. So as we come to the close of our time here, I've got a couple questions. If we think of, at least from an investable time horizon endgame, you guys are playing in 12-year funds, call it. So picture yourself 12 years from now, looking back, what does success look like? What happened? How has your business evolved? I think our business will evolve over the next five years into a bigger business, a business with probably more investable swim lanes in terms of where we go and where we go with capital and how we deploy capital. Being such a customer-driven organization, our customers are sort of pulling us in that direction. I absolutely believe that we'll double the size of our assets under management within five years. I don't think that's a crazy or heroic thing to think about. I think our balance sheet will continue to grow as we generate more earnings and more FIM. We have the ability to lever those earnings in the form of securitized trusts, and that gives us a bigger balance sheet and the ability to put more assets under balance sheet, which gives us more long-term predictable earnings. I'm always a little less fussed about the form. I'm more fussed about the substance of what we do. As long as we don't change our compass and we continue to underwrite the way we've been underwriting and we back great people who have great ideas and provide them that intellectual capital and that physical capital, I have no doubt that our organization and our business will continue to grow. It's been a fantastic three years since we completed the merger, coming up on three years this July. And if I think about a year where I don't have to worry about selling old real estate and I get to focus just on my core business, that actually makes it an easier proposition for investors. And it's easier for us too, as professionals, in terms of having that clarity where we wake up and where we're putting capital to work. Makes me pretty excited. On that, a closing question. You've personally built and helped start five or six businesses. You have your hands in 25 today. What are two key lessons that you think could be extrapolated and generalized to other businesses? This would be advice you would give to someone who's attempting to build and lead. First and foremost, team building is everything. And when you have the wrong member of a team, the mistake that I've made previously is I've held on to bad people too long. Don't do that. You should always be top grading and create your own definition of top grading, but don't hang on to subpar performers. You'll find that when you do get rid of somebody that doesn't fit on a team and you replace them with someone who's got more energy or has got the right fit, the rest of the team lifts up. So we have this tendency to want to rescue people. Sometimes you just can't rescue people. You got to move on and you got to move quickly. I think in the aftermath of having taken over Colony and having to fix that same sort of advice, which is make decisions, make them quickly, make them swiftly, create your strategy and execute ruthlessly. I can't tell you along this two and a half year journey, how many people would say, well, look, don't sell that asset and hold on to this or hold on to that. That never works. You define a strategy, you get the right people around that strategy, and then you go execute the strategy. And if somebody's not on that strategy, you got to get them off the bus. Having the foresight to be really convicted around your ideas and understanding how to follow your conviction is an important part of being an entrepreneur. It's an important part of being a great leader. It's an important part of being a really good CEO. Then I'd give a third one, which is never underestimate the power of a strong balance sheet and liquidity, particularly as we head into the next two to three years, which should have a fair amount of bumpy patches. Just be ready. Always have your balance sheet ready. Don't be surprised. Investors don't like surprises. So we spent the last couple of years cleaning up our balance sheet, getting our leverage way down and getting ourselves in a position to where we can play offense. Investors always appreciate that. Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure. You have grown up with this digital infrastructure industry and have now become the sage of it. And I am really grateful for how much I've learned from you over the years and again, how much you've shared with us all today. Thank you very much and best of luck. I feel the same way. It's been nice friendship as friends and investors together and I hope we'll continue to keep investing together. Thank you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 